Let's open our Bibles to Proverbs 14. As you're opening to Proverbs 14, we're opening to look at another portrait in the Scriptures of what God wants from us, our segment of our How to Pray for Your Children. That's the series we're looking at, for those of you joining us this morning, is about how to pray for godly daughters. How do you pray and influence and lead and model in such a way that that you influence that little life to be a godly young woman. Now, most of us, if if you're around a a church on Mother's Day, you'll hear talk of the great woman in Proverbs... What? What? Nobody remembers. Proverbs 31. Okay, now you knew it. Proverbs what? There you go. Proverbs 31. Well, this morning I'd like to introduce you to another woman in Proverbs. It's the Proverbs 14 woman. So if you want to turn to Proverbs 14 with me, we're going to look at the contrast. See, Proverbs 31, the the virtuous woman who can find her worth as far above rubies, is contrasted in Proverbs 14, verse 1. Contrasted to show that the great virtuous woman also has an opposite, the foolish non-virtuous, non-pleasing and excellent to the Lord woman. And that's what we'd like to look at because God has inspired these two pictures in Proverbs. The one in Proverbs 31 is the woman of wisdom, the elegantly resourceful woman, kind of the the ultimate expression of what a, a godly woman is like. She's humble, she's beautiful, she excels in wisdom. Totally opposite is the woman of Proverbs 14. She is the antithesis of excellence. She is the opposite of virtue. She is a destroyer, a troubler, and a woman who lacks wisdom. A godly woman and a godly young lady learn their manners from God's word. That's how it's been for centuries. All the godly and wise women have always looked at the scriptures as their model, as their guide. And it sounds like a great idea to me. And this morning, if you want to look over the shoulders of the great biblical women of the faith who throughout the centuries have poured over the scriptures to model their lives after what pleases God, then we can do so by looking at Proverbs 14. I'm going to read verses between verse 1 and down through verse 9. You listen as I read, and then we'll ask God to open our hearts to his great truth. Proverbs 14.1, the wise woman, now this would be the, the hero, our heroine, uh, this is a Proverbs 31 woman, filled with God's wisdom, builds her house. It means everything in her life supports what God has called her to. So she builds that. But look, here's the, the antithesis. But the foolish woman pulls it down with her hands. Isn't that graphic? I mean, the one is, is doing everything, laying the groundwork and building a godly home. The other one is tearing and ripping and pulling it apart. Well, look at these other contrasts which support this. Verse 2, he who walks in up, uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is perverse despises, again, a great contrast. Verse 4, I love this for uh, homemaking. Where no oxen are, uh, the stall is clean. I always tell that to Bonnie. I say, if we didn't have even little oxen running around this house, it would always be clean. We have many oxen, much dirt, right? So if, you're, if you want to be alone and have a clean house, have no children, you'll be lonely. Uh, if you want to have an exciting place, have children and they're little oxen and they make a mess. Okay, verse 7. But go from the presence of a foolish man when you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. Verse 9. Fools mock at sin, but above the upright there's favor. All that to go back to verse 1. Reading it backward. The foolish woman pulls down the house with her hands. She mocks at sin. She mocks at God's wisdom. But on the other hand, the wise, everything in her life builds the house, the home, the life that God wants for her. Let's bow together in prayer. Oh, Lord, I pray that in a powerful way, your spirit would just open our hearts, the eyes of our understanding to your word. Help us to hear you speaking through Solomon's inspired words on the pages of this book in these proverbs help us to hear you speaking to our hearts to our lives to our families to our daughters to ourselves oh lord let us hear your voice and respond today in jesus name we ask it amen what a what a contrast 
What a contrast. The whole book uh, of Proverbs is either comparative or contrastive. Either it's amplifying the virtues or it's showing the contrast between the wise and the foolish. Turn back to chapter 11 of the book of Proverbs, verse 29, because I want to add to this. Because the wise woman is a builder of a godly home. She's a model of godly conduct. The foolish woman is a destroyer. She just comes in and knocks it down, kind of like a, uh, an angry child that tries to break the, the buildings or toys or Legos of, of another child when they're upset at them. And that ungodly woman destroys her home, her family, and eventually her own very life. And she does it word by word and person by person because uh, an ungodly person, their words, their actions stifle what God wants around them. Chapter 11, verse 29, tells the outcome of this uh, Proverbs 14 woman, which is the negative, which is the contrastive. And it says in verse 29 of Proverbs 11, uh, he who troubles his own house will inherit the wind, and the fool be the servant to the wise of heart. Did you catch that? If you are a troubler, a destroyer, uh, someone who tears down your own home by your actions and words and attitudes, you are, what does it say in verse 29? inheriting the wind. Have you ever inherited the wind? Can you hold it? Can you keep it? No, it just gets away from you. And what it says is if your foolish life will get away from you and nothing will be left of any value, he who troubles his own house inherits the wind. Well, I uh, was thinking about this when I thought of that great classic I've never sat down and watched. I have to tell you, my children... Uh, have this uh, Gone with the Wind. It must be about eight hours long. I don't know. It seems like it's endless. You know, it has two parts, I think. And I don't, I don't think I've ever sat down for the whole thing, but I have, over the years, come through enough times and watched for a moment. I think I've seen almost the whole thing. And basically, if you've never seen Gone with the Wind, it's an American tale that vividly portrays what we're talking about this morning. The outcome of the life of, a, of an ungodly woman who is foolish. Now, let me just summarize it. The movie is based on Margaret Mitchell's novel about a little slice of Southern living. And I don't mean the magazine. I mean life in the South in the strife-torn Civil War era. And the key themes of the movie are so similar to those of the Proverbs 14 woman. In fact, just, just think about, if you've ever seen it, what the movie's about. It was about the life of a woman who was oblivious to everything around her except herself. I mean, when, when people are dying uh, of, of cannon wounds and gangrene, she's worried about her perfume, you know what I mean, and whether she's going to have a delicacy for a meal. It's a vividly selfish and indulgent life the main character leads. Of course, that enticing southern belle is Scarlett O'Hara, who is only pretty on the outside. See, that's what the Proverbs 14 woman is. She is only externally appealing. But inwardly, as we'll see this morning, she's just uh, like the wounded men of the Civil War, a gangrenous of the soul. And so Scarlett O'Hara is a cunning and crafty woman who knew what she wanted and always tried to get it. And her self-centeredness is, by Margaret Mitchell, always contrasted through the movie with the other heroine, Melanie, the weak, sickly, and and always seeing the best in people person who is unselfish and giving. And those two go through side by side, almost like Proverbs 14 presents. I'm not saying anything about the virtues of Melanie in a godly sense, but Solomon, under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, contrasts the selfish and indulgent foolish woman to the sweet and selfless wise woman and tells us that the outlook for a marriage, the outlook for a home, the outlook for the life of a foolish, ungodly woman is abysmal because if you're self-centered, you'll tear everything of any value down around you. Well, how do we cultivate the godliness of our daughters? As I started last week, there are over 200 verses in Proverbs that talk about boys and girls, men and women, godly men, godly women, godly young men, godly young women, and it contrasts those lives to the foolish And in those 200 verses, I picked out just about 10 this morning. In the sense of how to pray 
for them. Now, we've already studied how to pray for spiritual reality. And all that we're talking about won't matter if we aren't working on that part for their salvation, for them being in God's word and, and uh, being sensitive toward God. And then we talked about their personal lives, how that needs to be cultivated. But we're looking at their relational lives, and we're looking at the reality of picking a, a chosen life partner, praying for them and seeing them and knowing them. And uh, I was just listening to a couple of teenagers. You know, teenagers are amazing. And if you listen to them, they were talking about cars. You know, you get to be about 16 on, you just talk about cars. And they were talking about, oh, look at that one. Oh, look at that one. And then one of them said to the other one, you know, I think we'll just know when we see the right car. You know what God says? You'll know when you see the right person that will glorify God for you to spend your life with. If you're looking at the manual, at the instructions. Let's do that this morning, starting in chapter 7. And I'm going to take you through Proverbs 7 and uh, give you a few other references. And by the way, if you're a Bible marker, I would encourage you to mark some of these verses. Uh, What I do is next to the proverb, I put a New Testament verse that illustrates it, and it, it really helps. But what we're going to look at is what godly women and godly young women look and act like. And, and remember how Proverbs is written. Now, now, these are going to be the first five of these verses are very negative. But what they're negative about is it's warning you what not to do. And so what I want to do is pull the positive message from the negative verse, starting in verse 10 of chapter 7. Point number one, a godly woman always seeks to be modest in her dress. Now, what will God do? He'll point out the ungodly. This is what it says in Proverbs 7.10. Uh, this is a story, and 5, 6, and 7, uh, parents, if you've never noticed this, is a very close-knit illustration that Solomon gives of young people being foolish about their, their modesty, about their morality, and it's just very, very powerfully written starting in chapter 5. But in chapter 7, verse 10, out came a woman to meet him. Who? A foolish man, the one we met last week that we're not to be like. So this this foolish man comes walking, and this woman, a foolish woman, comes to meet him. And look at, look at what characterizes her. Did you know your dress does matter? It says she's dressed like a prostitute. She is dressed in a way that is enticing and alluring so that men only think and look at her body, not her spirit, not her character, not her father in heaven, her enticingness of her body. And so she comes out dressed like a prostitute, with crafty intent. You see, she knows what she's doing. There are few naive people that dress in this way. They know what they're doing. Her clothing points not to her Father in heaven and his holiness. It points rather to the enticements that she seeks to bring. Now, if you're a a margin writer, turn to uh, or write 1 Timothy 2.9. If you want to turn there, you can mark it in your Bible. But 1 Timothy 2.9 is the New Testament parallel to this. And what it says there in Paul's little letter to uh, Timothy as he was pastoring the church at Ephesus is this, 1 Timothy 2.9. He says, I want women to dress modestly with decency and propriety. And then he goes through not with braided hair, or gold or pearls or expensive clothes. He says, I want their clothing to point to their father in heaven and his ownership of their lives. In first service, we had a baby dedication. And the whole idea of that was the parents acknowledging that child came from God and that they wanted to present that one back to the Lord and raise them in such a way that will glorify God. The same is true about our body. We are not our own. God created us. He is our creator. He bought us. We're bought with a price. Therefore, this body is to please him. Now look, back to Proverbs 7.10. Does that godly woman want to emphasize enticing dress in herself? Or does she want to emphasize what Paul says in 1 Timothy 2.9, the, the beauty that God says is, is great in his sight, the unseen character. That's what God wants us to emphasize, the unseen character, the holiness, the, the, the reflection of God. The flesh will always flaunt the body, but God will always beautify the spirit. And so the first thing we see, number one, a godly woman always seeks to be modest in her dress. Look at verse 13 of Proverbs 7, because the story goes on. A godly woman, secondly, always seeks to be holy in her conduct, her her whole deportment, how she conducts herself. The 13th verse, negatively again, the foolish woman that's going to inherit the wind, 
took hold of this fella, the simpleton, and took hold of him and kissed him and with a brazen face said, I have fellowship offerings, I've fulfilled my vows, and basically propositions him. Well, what this shows is that she was godless and didn't fear the Lord because a godly woman always wants to be holy in her conduct. She fears the Lord. She seeks his well done and the approval of him more than anybody on earth. See, that's the difference. A godly person wants God's approval. An ungodly person wants the crowd's approval, the friends, the peers, the people around them. They want them to, to adore, or adulate, or, or honor them with their attention. But a godly person says that is not important because this, my Father in heaven, is. So the contrast is so powerful. This woman, this godly woman's fear of God, makes her aware of the future consequence of her choices. A godly woman avoids any present situation that would destroy future usefulness to God. You know, the, the greatest thing we can do with our children is to raise them to be useful to God. It doesn't matter if, if they're a genius in, in some specialty field if they're not useful to God. For what does it profit if you gain all the awards of your particular uh, giftedness on this earth but forfeit God's well done? See, as parents, we need to think not to have the greatest architect in the world or the greatest lawyer in the world, but to have a young man or woman that we raise in our family that is the greatest servant of God. Maybe as an architect or as a lawyer or as a musician or whatever, but useful to God. See, that's what wisdom brings, and that's what we teach them. Why is that? Well, 1 Corinthians, and in, in next to uh, verse 13 and 14, I have a little mark in, in my Bible, and it says, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Let me read that to you. Because if a godly woman seeks to be holy in her conduct, it's for this reason. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? He is in you. You have received him from God, and you're not your own. Verse 20. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. That's what motivates this woman to act this way. Honor God with the body he owns. Your conduct, the, the, where you take what you do, honor him. That's what a godly woman always seeks to be, holy in her conduct. Look at verse 21. The story goes on. Proverbs 7, verse 21. Because a godly woman will always seek to be truthful in her speech and in her motives. Because, here's the, the wicked, foolish woman of Proverbs 14, in verse 21 of chapter 7, with her enticing speech. I mean, I can just hear Scarlett O'Hare buttering up Rhett or, or whoever she was wanting to get money from or, or whatever she wanted. With her enticing speech, she caused him, this is the foolish man, to yield. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. Verse 22, immediately he went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter. Now, since most of us get our meat in, uh, you know, shrink-wrapped on a styrofoam plate, that means nothing to us. But but if you've ever been at a stockyard, especially if you've ever raised and fattened up a, a cow or a pig and taken it to the slaughterhouse, boy, does that bring pictures to my mind. I remember we would, in New England, we used to raise and even smoke the bacon and the hams and everything in the smokehouses. And I remember when we brought over those animals to the slaughterhouse, they would come up if it was a cow chewing its cud, kind of like a kid with too much gum in their mouth, you know. And it would stand there, and they would get it in that little chute, and then they would take that sawn off 22 and just lightly place it on its head and bang, it would collapse like a table whose legs broke, just boom, straight down, just like that. Didn't even know what was coming. They were just chewing their wad and all of a sudden, boom, and they collapse. That's the picture. Look at this. Look at this foolish man. He went after her as an ox goes to the slaughter. Didn't even know what hit him when it hit him. What is this saying? It's saying this woman was deceitful. She's ugly in God's sight because she's self-driven. She wants her own way. And God says a beautiful woman wears heavenly beauty. Let, let me show you what I mean. You, this one is so good. Look at 1 Peter 3 and verse 4. 1 Peter 3 and verse 4. Because the Lord says how you talk. Now, 1 Peter, New Testament, you go past all those little epistles, and you go Hebrews, James, and 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 4. This, God says how you talk is critical and vital in my sight. Verse 4, he says, Let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very great 
in worth in God's sight. This, this woman was beautiful because she had a true flesh. She was clothed with, with this beautiful, incorruptible, gentle, quiet spirit. We'll see that a little bit later in, uh, in Proverbs 9. But, but think about the contrast between the deceitful, manipulative, flattering woman and the godly, virtuous, truth-honoring, truth-wearing woman. Fourthly, now go to Proverbs 9 with me. And that's why I don't want you to get lost. Proverbs, Psalms, Proverbs. Go to the right of Psalms if you're not there yet. Book of Proverbs, ninth chapter. Look at the 13th verse. Because this this is uh, powerful. A godly woman, listen to this, always seeks to be gentle and quiet. Why? Because look at the foolish woman that we're not to be like. Proverbs 9, 13. The woman of folly, this is a woman that, that tears her life apart, is loud undisciplined, and without knowledge. Back in chapter 7, uh, verse 11 in Proverbs, go back there and see. He, he says the same thing Solomon does in chapter 7, verse 11. It says, she is loud and defiant, and her feet never stay at home. That means she's disrespectful, she's hostile, she's aggressive, she's cunning. And by the way, all of those character qualities are bad news. They're, they're, they're not a good diagnosis Why is that? Because they're opposite of what God honors. Now, again, if you're a Bible marker, right next to verse 11 of chapter 7, I have three references written down. I'm going to read them to you. The first one is 2 Timothy 2.24. And let me read it to you. The Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Now, remember, the greatest thing in life is to be useful to God. Well done, good and faithful. What does Jesus say? Servant. What is God measuring our lives by? Whether or not you were a servant. Okay. 2 Timothy 2.24. The Lord's servant doesn't strive and quarrel. They are not hostile, defiant, and aggressive for their own way. The Lord's servant doesn't strive. But they're kind that's a fruit of the Spirit. Gentle, that's a fruit of the Spirit. And they're, they're characterized by not being resentful. They don't, they don't have to attack to get their way. Here's another one, James 3.17, if you're marking this. Uh, and if you want to turn there, you should have it marked by now, but, but I'll read it to you. James 3.17. Now, I call this the download verse, okay? A lot of people, everybody's getting into computer everything, you know, these days, and Internet and everything. Well, this is when you download from God. Okay, James 3.17, this is what it says. The wisdom that comes down from above. Now, that's contrasted to the wisdom that comes up from beneath. There's worldly wisdom, which is selfishly ambitious and causes tension and irritation and argumentative. That is earthly wisdom that says you do it your way and get it any way you want. God says, no, no, if you have my wisdom, you download it from above. It comes from him. And here's what it's like, James 3.17. It's pure peace-loving, considerate, submissive, merciful, fruitful, impartial, and sincere. That's the character of someone who's downloaded their operating system by God's server through the Holy Spirit because they're his and they belong to him. So what is a godly woman like? She has downloaded a gentle and quiet spirit. She has, has received and accepted the wisdom from above. Here's another verse, if you want to write down 1 Peter 3, again, right next to uh, Proverbs 7.11. This is what it says. It says in verse 1 of 1 Peter 3, Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if they don't obey the word, without a word, you can win them by your conduct. What's that conduct like? Verse 2, they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Who are you afraid of? Them? No, God. No, no, no. I get my my marching orders, and I get my approval from him. Uh, He is the one that matters, that that he says that it's right. So what does it look like? Verse 3, don't let your adornment be merely outward, arranging your hair, wearing gold, and putting on fine apparel. Verse 4, but rather let it be the hidden person of the heart, the incorruptible beauty, verse 4, of a gentle and quiet spirit. That's precious to God. Now, Proverbs 7, 11 It says she's loud and rebellious. God says, that doesn't please me. That's not a godly woman. He says, what pleases me is a gentle and quiet spirit. Now, 
I'd like to take a portable x-ray machine here, okay, the Bible. And, and let's take this and let's use it to scan those that we're raising in our family, okay? And this morning, I want you to do a little diagnostic. You know, you get a little spot here or there, a little something wrong, and they, they uh, magnetically, you know, do some resonance imaging of you, MRIs, or they do a CAT scan or something else. They, they, or if you break something, they, they x-ray or you fracture, and they're checking you out. Well, let's look at our lives in light of these verses, and especially the lives of those in our home. Let me, let me do a little uh, diagnosis here. My question is, moms and dads, have you stopped holding up the Word of God like this and look through it to analyze your children and, and ask yourself, what are you raising? What's going on in your home? As you hold up your daughters to the x-rays of God's Word, do you see a wise woman through, this, through the screen or do you see a foolish one through the screen? You say, what do you mean? Well... Is your daughter loud, assertive, boisterous, and whiny? Does she always want to be the center of attention? That would be the Proverbs 14 woman. That would be the woman that's going to inherit the wind. Or is she quiet, submissive, gentle, and humble? That's the the one that God says is beautiful, and he's going to bless them all their days. Which is it? Remember what Moses did just before he passed off the scene, God took him up and and killed him and buried him uh, in a place that no one knew. Do you remember just before he passed off to Joshua what he said in Deuteronomy 30, verse 20? Someday read it. It says, Behold, I said before you this day, blessing and cursing, life and death. Therefore, choose life. You know, that's the Christian life, a choice. Choose how you're going to raise your daughter. Are you going to raise her to be a, a godly, virtuous, quiet, humble, submissive? Are you going to raise her to be a boisterous, whiny, center of attention, spoiled, foolish, inheritor of the wind, kind of a painted-up Scarlet O'Hara. Secondly, does she dress in a way that draws a young man to think about her body, or does she dress in such a way that her spirit and its beauty are the first thing they notice? Have you ever thought about that? What father or mother in this church would allow their daughter to wear transparent clothing so that the boys wonder how much of her underwear they can see through that outfit. Certainly a father or mother that wants to inherit the wind and trouble and evil. Does she have a holy hatred of sin or does she have a desire to watch sinners and they become her heroes? The television, the movies, and the the cheap novels. Does she learn to live out the fleshly fantasies of her heroes? You say, that's ridiculous. It is? Is it? I mean, really? In our culture? Do you know how many people leave their husbands and wives because of their fantasies over the Internet and they meet? I mean, here in Tulsa, how many families have been destroyed because they they met someone that was alluring to them and corresponded with them and finally snuck off and met them and destroyed their family? It doesn't, as the Puritans used to say, long before the Internet, they say the wagons go where the ruts are. No one ends up in a tragic, immoral situation that in their mind was not building ruts. The wagons of their desires were going that way, and and they followed it. Fourthly, does she use all of her powers to get her own way? That's a foolish woman. Does she manipulate with her tears or looks and whatever it takes to accomplish her ends? That's not a woman that is pleasing to God or that we should have as as a desire to raise? Is she argumentative? Does she easily quarrel with others? Or is she peaceable, gentle? Has she downloaded the operating system God offers? Now listen, as you take the the x-ray machine of God's word and, and scan across the life of your daughters, let me ask you that if any of these symptoms are present in any degree or amount and they're not dealt with, I mean, you find a spot of skin cancer, a spot on the lung, any type of, of malignancy, what do we do? We cancel everything and we go as quick as we can and we take care of that. But we find the deadly, gangrenous cancer of, of what we're talking about this morning. We go, well, we hope they grow out of it. They'll grow out of it as well as you grow out of cancer. It will kill their usefulness spiritually to God. Well, as one gifted expositor who was commenting on chapter 7 of Proverbs, verse 11, let me read to you what he said. 
He says, we may say with a surgeon's frankness that a woman characterized by loudness and rebellion, whininess and boisterousness, will have a home like Scarlett O'Hara's. Isn't that interesting? Troubled, torn down, and literally gone with the wind. Very, very true. Well, let's go to Proverbs 31 now and finish the rest of our time on the other side of the contrast, okay? Let's look at Proverbs 31, which talks about the virtuous, godly, wise woman of excellence. Now, Proverbs 31 just pulls together literally dozens, scores of verses that are peppered throughout the book of Proverbs that talk about all the the virtues of wisdom, and it just kind of puts them together. In fact, many commentators think that this was Solomon's description of his mother, Bathsheba, who, though she defaulted and was immoral and committed sin, she was forgiven and chose to live in a godly way. Whatever it was, maybe it was his great-great-great-grandmother Ruth. We don't know, but it's an inspired portrait. But look at this, starting in verse 13. A godly woman, we've already seen, seeks to be modest in her dress, holy in her conduct, truthful in her speech, and gentle and quiet in her spirit. But next, she always seeks to be involved with what God has said he's going to bless, and that is a homemaker. And it says in verse 13, she seeks wool and flax. That means uh, material of some kind. She willingly works with her hands. Uh, and You know what I have written right next to that in my Bible? Titus 2.5. Why do I have that written? Because this is how Paul, who, by the way, had mastered the Old Testament scriptures, who had the Holy Spirit inspiring him, with that great combination of having memorized most of the Old Testament, if not all of it, and being writing the scriptures under the inspiration of God's Spirit. This is what he says in Titus 2.5. He says this, A godly woman is a worker at home. Oik erga. She loves homework. doesn't mean from school. It means from God. She likes her homework. God gave her to do. In other words, she loves to tangibly serve others with food, with skills. She has a home that's open, a home that's hospitable. She's given to ministry to the sick and the needy and the less fortunate. That's how the New Testament describes this godly woman. Not that she has the house beautiful or the better home and garden. It's not that she has the latest kind of granite or whatever. She has a home that is a tool that is open for ministry, that's open for strangers, that's open for God to use, training up little lives and ministering to those outside the home. She seeks to be a homemaker. She's not forced to. She's not tied to it. She's not bound to it except by the cords of love. Look at verse 15. A godly woman also seeks to serve others. I mean, this woman has... uh, the the mind of Christ. She doesn't look on her own things, but the things of others. And see what it says in verse 15? She rises while it's yet night and provides food for her household. She's a planner, a thinker, a server. She she even provides a portion for her maidservants. Verse 20, I love this. She extends her hands to the poor. She reaches out her hands to the needy. She has learned the love of Christ for others. God says you can fulfill all the law with two options or two uh, available obediences, love God completely and love others as you love yourself. In other words, you're a selfless servant of others and a spirit-filled worshiper of God. That's everything you need to know. Just love others and love the Lord supremely. Look at verse uh, 11. This woman uh, also in Proverbs 31 is seeking to be a person that can be trusted. Uh, Again, contrastive to the foolish Proverbs 14 woman who you couldn't trust. It says, verse 11, the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so he has no need of spoil. You know what spoil is? When you leave stuff unattended, it rots. You know what? He has no worry that, that, that she is going to have rotten parts of her life, that she's going to leave unattended her duties to her home, to her children, to her Father in heaven. She, he safely trusts in her. No need of spoil. Verse 12, I love this. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. It's an investment that just grows sweeter, more precious. Uh, Also, here's another one. Look at verse 16 of Proverbs 31. A godly woman always seeks to be prudent in financial matters. Uh, This woman, by the way, wasn't wearing a babushka and tied to her sink. Look at this, what she does. She considers a field and buys it from her profits. She plants a vineyard. I mean, this, this woman is a very sophisticated woman. Uh, And and the biblical woman is. Verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them. 
and supplies sashes for the merchants. I mean, she is a saver, not a spender. We can see she sees beyond today alone. She's not just living for what she can get out of it at the mall today, you know. She's looking down the road and sees how she can be prudent in financial matters. Look at verse, 19, or, uh, verse 17 first. A godly woman always seeks to be a hard worker. Verse 17, she girds herself with strength. She strengthens her arms. Verse 19, she stretches out her hand to the distaff. Uh, with her hand, she holds a spindle. You know what this means? It means when work's there, it doesn't retract her or repel her. She doesn't pull away from it. She goes toward it. And you know what happens if, if a godly woman goes toward work? Her children learn to work. She's a model. Um, boy, is that needed in our world today. Most, most kids are... I'm not going to tell my, my joke I always tell. I always say that when I was in high school, I thought manual labor was the president of Mexico. But I'm not going to tell you that. Uh, you know, uh, it's not good. But, but basically what I'm saying is she's a hard worker. She, she stretches toward, not away from. She's not slothful or indolent. L- look at verse 23. Here's another description. This godly woman always seeks to be a person who has a good reputation. Um, this is amazing. In Proverbs 31, 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. You know what he's known for? He's known for the virtue and godliness because the context of this whole 31st chapter is who can find this excellent woman. And in that context, this woman who is giving to the poor, who is so prudent, who is so thrifty, who is so godly in her conduct, this man is known in the gates. He has a reputation for this woman that he's married to. This is what Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, 7, which I have in the margin right there by Proverbs 31, 23. It says, He must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. In other words, Paul says that your family, your wife and children, reflect on your character. Make sure they're reflecting God's character, is what he says. And so this woman does. She has a good reputation, a good reflection. Look at verse 26. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. A godly woman also seeks to internalize biblical wisdom so it comes out her mouth. Now, I always think about that. When, when I was little, we raised Arabian quarter horses. We had, uh, I mean, I learned very quickly when I learned to ride this Arabian that you don't use, we're not John Wayne with a farm horse going, you know, pulling those reins back. That horse would stand up on its back legs, its hind legs, if you pulled the reins back that far. It was one of those that you just lightly move the reins. I mean, they're very responsive, and you don't jerk it. They have a real responsive mouth. You don't need a great big bit and bridle and rank them like this. That's what this woman's like. It says the law of kindness is what's on her tongue. I mean, that governs everything she does. She's very sensitive in what she says. The word is in her heart and life, so it comes out her mouth. And when words come out of her mouth, they are dressed in the Holy Spirit. They are gentle and kind. Why? Because verse 26 says she's internalized biblical wisdom. This download has gone beyond her mind to her heart, and it comes out her mouth. What a blessed woman this is that we can raise, pray for, and encourage. Just uh, two more. Verse 25. It says this. Strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. This means that a godly woman also seeks to live out these secrets so the future will smile at her. So that the future is just... I remember when, when Bonnie and I, almost 19 years ago, were sitting in the second row of Grace Community Church and this young pastor was there. His name was Gary Ezzo. And he was teaching all of us how to, how to grow kids God's way, he called it. I remember he said something that everyone laughed at. He said, the teenage years of your family will be the greatest and most wonderful, happiest years of your life. And there were about six or 700 of us in the class. And all the ones who had older kids were all going, ha, 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 we don't believe it. Do you know why? Because so many of those parents were inheriting the wind. Because the women and the men, as we saw last week and this week, were not clothed with strength and honor from the Spirit of God, and the future was not smiling at them. Here's the last one. Look at verse 28. A godly woman always seeks to be a person who can be praised for doing the right things. Proverbs 31, 28. Her children arise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. 
Uh, it was about a month ago. I was down by the little tiny short bed that Elizabeth sleeps in. It's only about this far off the ground. And she had, you know, she f- fixed all of her pillows. And I said, no, honey, you've got to pray on your knees next to Daddy. So we got there. And uh, we folded our hands and we were praying. And I prayed and then she prayed. And this is the first time she'd ever prayed this. She said, oh, Lord, help me not to be as bad a sinner tomorrow as I was today. That was a good one. That wasn't the good part, though, you know, because I had been reminding her how sinful she was. And so that was on her mind. And she said, I want to serve you. And then she paused, and she opened her eye and looked up at me, and she said, and I want to grow up and be a godly woman just like Mama. Now, where do you think she caught that from? Look, look again at verse 28. Her children, the godly woman's children, arise up and call her blessed. Why? How do you get your children to rise up and call their mother blessed? Look at the next three words. Her husband does. You know what? For the month before, every time we got our knees by our bed, what Daddy said? Lord, help Elizabeth to be less of a sinner tomorrow than she is today and help her to serve you and help her to grow up and be a godly woman like her mother. Well, she spent a month looking her over, and she finally agreed with it. And she said, I'm going to agree. I'm going to rise up and call her blessed. And look at her husband also, and he praises her. A godly woman seeks to be a person who can be praised for doing the right thing, who likes to live out the secrets of a godly life in verse 25, who internalizes biblical truth in verse 26, who has a good reputation in verse 23. She's a hard worker in verse 17. She's prudent in verse 16 with her finances. In verse 11, she can be trusted. She wants to serve others, as verse 15 says. Verse 13, she wants to be a homemaker. And all that because she doesn't want to be like the Proverbs 14 woman and inherit the wind.